Now, it's with great pleasure I introduce our opening keynote speaker. And although he truly needs no introduction, I do believe a few words are appropriate. He has been involved in the capital markets for about 50 years and being an absolute legend in the in industry for the majority of that time. He is an appointment to the Order of Canada with a list of other awards and has been a serious philanthropist through the Sprott Foundation, Can Fund, and too many other efforts to mention here today. He sits among an elite list of brokerage entrepreneurs in the Canadian marketplace from the 1980s and 90s, such as Ned Goodman, Lawrence Bloomberg, Jimmy Conacher, and Bob Dorrance. He's also one of the early Canadian hedge fund pioneers that later divested his entire ownership to the entire to the employees of his firm. More recently, from the past decade, he's displayed his unique ability to grow vast amounts of wealth in a mining industry that most investors have fled from. Today, he's single-handedly the greatest advocate in the junior resource industry. And although he has a discerning focus to his investments, he always lets his own money do the speaking for him. It is my extreme pleasure to introduce our opening keynote, Eric Sprott. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, good morning, everyone. I see a lot of uh, very familiar faces here, ex-colleagues, current partners, uh, investee companies that we've been involved with and, and still involved with, and uh, welcome all. Um, I think I gave the first keynote address at the first Red Cloud Club, like Strike Cut Cut, whatever the, name of the company is. Uh, eight years ago in Little Wee Office, where I was standing and everyone else was standing, it might have been all 20 or 30 people there. And I've done it, I think, once or twice subsequently. And the reason I uh, do this is because I'm a huge believer in what Red Cloud does, that the space that they serve, and as Bruce mentioned, the, uh, the service that they have. So I'm always uh, very happy to come here and talk about gold and silver, and I'm not really gonna concentrate much on stocks today, I think there might be a Q&A after, so we'll see how far we get with that. Um, this chart is a great example of why Red Cloud is important because small caps outperform big caps. You know, small caps outperform big caps. My whole investment career has always been investing in small caps. And when you get a winner, it's a big winner. And that's why I'm here, because the work that Red Cloud does in small cap stocks, and hopefully you can find a, a, a small cap stock that uh, can really knock it out of the ballpark. Uh, you know, when I came here, and in fact, I didn't even know I was coming here. Uh, I think Robert Lee phoned me up, said, are you going to be around on whatever date? Today is September 26th or something. I said, yeah, probably in town. Well, you want to do a dress behind? Let me think about it, okay? Anyway, then I got the invitation from Red Club. Oh, Eric Sprott is a keynote speaker. <laughs> <laughs> here I am. <laughs> Where Robert is, I don't do this anymore. Okay. <laughs> Okay, um, oh yeah, these are a couple of comments. I, I want to, you know, I'm always concerned that uh, precious metals are under pressure and manipulated. We'll have lots more to talk about on that. But I want to go back to a couple of comments from central bankers. <laughs> one was the first one, it's probably a mistake to allow gold to rise so high. That was Paul Volcker. Uh, when gold was hitting a record high, and of course there was a problem in, in the financial business, and if you know one thing, it's that they don't want gold prices to let people know what the weaknesses are. So they control it. And then we have Mr. Greenspan in 1995, Treasure banks stand, stand ready to lend out enough gold if the gold prices rise. And that's exactly what they did. They lend out gold to keep the price down. So you know that the central banks have been in there. Now, this is a chart of the 24-hour trading of gold, and there's two segments. When the London bullion market's open, and when non-London bullion market is open. And the, the line on the top is what the price would be if you just took the net changes per day in the outside of London trading time, 
And the bottom chart is what the net price would be if you took just when London was open. And when London's open, you'd have a net $2 an ounce. Is the cumulative net change in London. And in the case of non-London, the price would be 20000 Now, why is it that that happens all the time? And of course, the LVMA is a joke in terms of transparency. Nobody has any idea what the hell's going on over there. And obviously, there's a lot of nefarious stuff going on over there. Now, I love this one, the indictment. Oh, man, I love that, reading that indictment. It's hard to read there, but I'm going to read it here. Uh, especially conspiracy to conduct or participate in an enterprise engaged in a pattern of racketeering activity. Is anybody from J.P. Morgan here? <laughs> no? yeah. On their way to jail. <laughs> uh, now, I've read that indictment, and it's, it's mostly about spoofing, unfortunately. Spoofing is just a temporary little thing. And of course, I think the bigger issue, and it's been written about very well uh, by Ted Butler, specifically in Silver, is the sort of three months wash, rinse, repeat. And uh, for example, I think we had an example of it last night. And I think they knocked the price of gold down 27 bucks because options were expiring that day. Well, what a great day to knock gold down. So all the options expire worthless, okay? Because they're always on the this, the uh, selling side of the option, and it's the retail and speculative guy who's on the long side of it. The other potential reason they might knock the price down is because he knew I was giving a speech today. <laughs> Pissed me off. <laughs> I thought I could write in here, gold would be, you know, 14, 15, 75, and everything's wonderful, end of conversation. But no, we have to justify our existence here. So, um, most of it was spoofing. Uh, there was some discussion in the indictment about what's called barrier options. I never even knew they existed before, but it's where you write an option at a set price, and the bankers would make sure that if they were a seller of the option, that the price never got there. If they're buyer of the option, it always was above there. And we've seen examples of that before. And you know, I was reflecting on the banks, and in fact, JP Morgan. They have three, I don't know, it's some kind of three serious. Misdemeanors where they pay these huge fines already. Um, they're already on essentially parole from their last thing that they rigged. And so, you know, when is somebody going to call us Spain? Spain here, they rigged foreign currencies, uh, LIBOR, they have the whale. I mean, there's just a long list of what did I read? Conspiracy and racketeering? You get it? That's essentially what happens here, I think. Unfortunately, the major banks in the world use us as fodder. We're always buying, okay? We're not out short. So every time we buy, they sell, oh, we'll screw that guy. Because we'll always take the opposite side. Almost every trade that goes on in the COMEX, it's a commercial bank selling and a speculator retail buying. Every for transaction for transaction. And they're always short. They always want the price to go down. Okay, uh, we've had some discussion on the, uh, the economy. This is just a chart on what the PMIs are doing. They're very, very weak. You would have seen the recent results in Germany where it was a horrible number for the PMI. You would have seen the consumer confidence uh, that was very weak in the United States. It dropped from something like 134 to 125 or something last month. Um, anyway, they're giving us an inclination of, of the fact that we have some problems out there. And what are some of the problems? As I stand here, and as I uh, kind of uh, speak to people in the public domain, not really people in this room, because people in this room all have great jobs, careers, slash, but people who are day to day, nine to five, and you kind of ask, well, how do how you get along? And the, the fact of the matter is that inflation, is way beyond the 2% number that the governments are perpetuating. I mean, I, I'm shocked when I find out I don't smoke, but a pack of smokes cost $18. Are you kidding me? Like, imagine if you're a real smoker, you're an American, and you make 15 bucks, it's costing like five grand a year to smoke, and you're making 30 grand. Like, it's astounding. And everything keeps going up. 
you know, don't try to get your car fixed and tell me there's no inflation. There's have a plumber come over or send your kids to school. In the U.S., and I'm going to go to that right now, uh, the problem, they got a huge problem in the medical system. Uh, healthcare has gone from 5% of GDP, I think, back in 1970 to something pushing 19% now. 19% of your economy is on, on spend on healthcare. And the status of people in the world is they're unhealthier, but they're paying four times as much. And it's out of control. And, and what we're finding is that uh, doctor's bills are creating bankruptcies. There's uh, t apparently 10 million Americans a year who get a medical bill that they can't pay. Well, let's deal with the 10 million number, okay? There's whatever, 340 million people in the States. You know, over a 10 year period, that's 100 million people that can't pay their bill. What's that gonna do to consumption? And what one of the things we're finding out now in today's world is that strangely enough, financing charges are going up. So as interest rates are going lower, the lenders are finding different ways of hacking people. And whether it's, you know, it's a $500 setup fee in your car loan or whatever, uh, for example, car, the interest cost or the uh, financial services cost to buy a car went up 9% last year. The Chapwood Index, which is an index of uh, basically 50 cities, 500 items that people purchase has gone up over 8% every year for the last 10 years. But that's just things you purchase, okay? That has nothing to do with inflation. It has nothing to do with, you know, how your income is being eroded here and how you're unable to stay up with things. And that may perhaps why the GDP goes up 2%. And you know what? If you put the inflation in property, let's say we put in inflation in a 60 in GDP that was 2 would turn to minus 4. That's what happens when inflation is, is a higher number. Your GDP goes down because all you're doing is spending greater money and getting less product. Okay, now we have a big event happening as we speak. We're all experiencing it. Okay, right now, started last week. Credit market chaos. Maybe you're not watching it. I gotta tell you, I have spent so many hours in credit market chaos these days because I don't really understand it that well. But the uh, repo rate last week went to 10%. The repo rate and the uh, secured overnight funding rate went from two and a half to five. Imagine you're in the bond market. You're a guy running a bond portfolio and you're watching this stuff. What the hell's going on here? Imagine if bond yields went up from two to 4% in a day. What would we all think? It'd be a crash. I'm telling you, it'd be a crash in the market. Like you would not believe. Okay. So why, why is that? Because there's that liquidity crisis in the banking business, okay? And initially, the Fed came out, I think it might have been the Thursday, Wednesday, whatever, and said, okay, if we're gonna do 50 billion of repos, okay? Uh, they do, they offer up the 50 billion repos and they get people that want like 65 billion of repos. That's how it will liquid the bank. This is your bank's asking for, to trade securities for money, okay? And then uh, yesterday, they announced that we've taken the repo, the daily repo, uh, to now 100 billion. And we're gonna have every, uh, three times a week, I think it is, they're gonna have a $30 billion some other facility, okay? So that now, in the space of about seven days, the Fed has committed 250 billion of liquidity. 250 billion. We're not talking small now, okay? This is in a week. And believe me, if you're in the credit markets, man, you'd be wondering what the hell's going on here. How could we have a system that has 1.4 trillion of reserves, and a week later, we have a shortage of reserves of 250 billion? Somebody's asleep at the switch here, okay? I, I think when I, I think of the New York Fed when I say that, and or the Fed, and or the Treasury. But that's a big deal, and it's not resolved yet. Okay, um, Bruce had mentioned negative yields. I mean, I don't really have much to add, but I was thinking of the, the guys over in uh, Denmark, I think it is, uh, where they have to pay 0.75 interest on a deposit of $100,000. And uh, the, the number two bank over there now, 
uh, charges them that to put the money in. The bigger bank, Danska, is not charging them that. But then again, Danska <laughs> has their own problems, okay? And they better keep the money in there because, uh, in fact, that stock's getting killed today because of one thing or another, money laundering or something. Um, at any rate, um, yields will make people do things. I keep thinking of the guy who goes, well, look, at, maybe I should put 10% of my money in gold. You know, I'm talking to his advisor. Maybe you put 10%. What's well, gold done this year? It's up 25%, 22%, whatever. Oh, it's up 22 and I gotta pay three quarters of one. Maybe we should put a little bit of money in there. Just a little bit. And now that I'm on the word little, you know that uh, precious metal securities of all sort, whether they're ETS or bullion, physical metal, uh, they represent roughly one half of one percent of all the investment vehicles in the world. And People like Ray Dalio and say, well, you know, we should have at least 10% of your money in precious metals. Well, we only produce 1.5% more precious metals a year. 1.5% more. Okay. Ergo, if you've got to get this one half to 10, it has to appreciate by 20 times to get to 10. We don't produce that much gold. Anymore. We don't produce that much silver for investment. Uh, maybe there could be some IPOs that would let people get into stocks, but you can't get to 10. So, negative interest rates, and uh, I guess I'm going to quote, quote from Ray Dalio here. He calls it a paradigm shift. There's a whole new way of thinking about what we should do. And that's a very important word from a very seriously well followed investor that I would suggest people think about, that we are in a paradigm shift. Paul Tudor Jones, gold is everything going for it. Uh, Jeff Gronlach, the bond king now, I'm certainly long gold. I thought the best one was buy gold at any level. Mark Mobius. And these are people that haven't gone there before, okay? Now my next charge, I just wanted to show you that in this very, very, very difficult time of investing in gold stocks, there's also a has been opportunity. Look at the gains on some of these things. Great bear, purple and gold. Look at the gains. This is almost in a bear market, for God's sake. What happens when we're in a bull market? What are the gains going to be? And I recently saw a uh, present value analysis for Dawn where they made the statement that if the price of gold doubles from 1250, at 25, our net asset value could appreciate by 22 times. I think that's wrong, actually. I think it's more like 10. But 10. You've got to double the price, you make 10 times of your money. Where are you going to make 10 times of your money in the next couple of years? Silver. I'll get to silver. That's just Can we go to silver now? Oh, now I'm toast. <laughs> There's the words. There was a final game. Um, now that might be very hard to read, but I want to make two points here. One is that the investment amount for silver last year, the amount that went into investment, which is coins and bars and uh, ETF inventory, okay, was a total of 23% of all the silver produced for investment. Don't forget the 23% of the market, okay? Because I can tell you in the case of gold, it's 19%. There's not much room for people to invest in silver. 23%, um, what are we talking here about? Uh, uh, Six million, 6,000 tons. 6,000 tons, which is, I don't know what that is, about eight or nine million ounces. That's it, that's what you can invest. Um, no, 80 or 90 million ounces. Something along that line. No, I got to have that wrong. 230 million ounces. Okay? And, uh, that's what the world can buy. I bought a million last week, okay? You got 229 left. <laughs> the other thing I want to point out is uh, that what they show is the net balance here, that bottom line, they have these little circles on. Every year, there's a deficit. There's been a deficit for 10 years. And I don't know what the deficit adds up to, but I need to do it quickly here. Uh, it's about 
but I'm going to be talking because this is a ton of things. So it's about uh, about a thousand tons, a thousand tons. That'd be forty percent of what we produce in a year. It's the deficit. Um, I want to go to the, the uh, solar ETF. Uh, they, these are the uh, solar holdings and ETFs. They have gone up. The amount that they've gone up by so far this year represents 17% of the solar market, 23% available for investment, 17 taken care of. All we have to do is take, take care of the next six. Okay. And the trading in the SLB and other silver ETFs has been extremely strong. So we are going to clean these guys out. Too. I'm pretty convinced of that. Now, we also have Indian imports. This is one month. 30, almost 37 million ounces in one month. We're talking, if you annualize that, 420 million ounces in a billion ounce market. Now, and you can't, you don't go from last year, let's say, going 200 tons to 1,000 tons, then it's for industrial use, okay? Don't kid yourself. You can't build factories that fast. This is for investment purposes. So between what India is buying, what uh, what's going into the ETFs, the equation doesn't work anymore, okay? It doesn't. And you can't buy a solar round from the Royal Canadian Mint anymore. Everyone's on allocation, including Sprout Money. The uh, Mint and the 100 ounce bars are non existent now, so far. Uh, same with the Australian Mint, restricting supplies. And we haven't started yet. Wait till we get going. What's going to happen to silver then? Okay. Oh my God! I'm finished. Okay, but I have a couple of comments here I want to make. These are these are little addendums. One, I'll just start with Bitcoin. So you know that theoretically Google has developed this quantum computer. Now I have no idea what that is. I don't. But apparently, it can take care of the cryptocurrency formula fast. So Bitcoins under pressure because it might be over for Bitcoin, which would also, I don't know. Okay. Um, the other thing I thought I should talk about Max Payne. Max Payne is the level to which a stock or commodity has to get for options to expire worthless, which is done every X option expiry in the States. The stock, the, the commodity under pressure goes to the max pain. That's actually what I think happened yesterday. Okay, the options expired yesterday. They take it down to 15, uh, gold down to 1500 and silver down to 18. All the options expire worth us. Thank you very much. Off we go. Because they all sold the options, got the premiums, and I want to make sure that nobody exercises these things, okay? So max pain is something you have to watch out for. Now I'm going to close my comments with uh, a little historical thing, recent historical thing. So there I am on May 28th at home, searching for news, and I read a uh, technical report by a guy named Chris Vermeulen. And as it turns out, Chris Vermeulen uh, lives, in, lives in Collingwood of all things. I didn't ever do that, okay? Um, but, I, but I've known, I've seen stuff before, I've never had subscribed to it. And I, that guy, that name strikes me as a guy who's not that bullish on gold and silver. You get this headline sort of suggests he might be. Oh, I better read it, okay? So I go and read it. And the price of gold was 1275 And uh, I might not have these dates exactly right, but he says in five to seven weeks, the price of gold is going to 1450 Five to seven weeks. Ooh, man. Let me make sure I don't go over my time here. Uh, I don't know. Of course, I'm, I'm a believer anyway, but he technically seems to have some reason. I go and check my kit go. Gold's up eight bucks. The hell's gold up eight bucks for it? Maybe it's working. <laughs> well, you know what? Eric gets to work. Eric gets to work. You probably noticed that. That Eric's been a busy guy. Buying things. A lot of things. Because he believed that it's going to 1450. And it went to 1440 in five to seven weeks. He was wrong. 
<laughs> so I see a Christopher Mueller thing this morning. I have his service, but I don't always get to it every day. And um, he says, Global Bottom early in October. Early in October is next week. And his target is 1795. 1795. Don't sit around. Don't be sitting around. This is going to happen. It's already happened. There's a guy that was almost right in the rain. So we're going to 21 to 23. Then he talks about some of the, uh, the big numbers out there. Somebody put in 23,000. Oh, yeah. Oh, but I think it was Pierre Lassan said 30 years from now, it'll be 23,000 or something. But there's been other, you know, $10,000 numbers and 5,000 and 20,000 and so on. He says, but we have a, an estimate that's way more conservative. We think it's going to 3750. <clears throat> Do you know what the guys in this room, the value of their stocks will be at 3750? You guys better listen up today. Thank you very much. Thank you.